Aloha, aloha mai kako. Um, my name is uh, Nainoa Thompson, and, I, and I'm from Hawaii. And I'm. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. I. It was powerful being in this uh, in this room this morning uh, with all of you. I'm from a very different place, and uh, I guess I, my impressions are is that. At least you've got a table to sit down to. At least you're in this room and you're united. And I say that from at home, that we don't have that kind of table to be collective, to be together, to be responsible, to be, have a chance to be historic. And that to see all of you from, what, 203 different reservations representing historically, what, 30-something nations to be in the same room to me, from my lens, and I say it in an extraordinarily humble way, that is powerful. And I envy that. And at the same time, I'm absolutely honored to be amongst, and even though I don't know you, I know your elders are here and your leaders are here, your leadership's here. I envy that too. And I want to certainly pay respect to the Muscum, this land that we're on, that I have the privilege to be on, and to the, the Coast Salish people for for giving me the privilege to be here. Um, I don't know exactly what's going to happen with this presentation. Um, uh, my sense is that it's, uh, I'm feeling that the, there's a, both the differences between us in Hawaii and at the same time, I'm feeling the things that are the same. One is the issue that um, the impacts of the colonization on us in Hawaii seems to be the same. That we do die younger, we make less money, we're less educated. And children tend to grow up in Hawaii of Hawaiian ancestry being less confident, feeling more inferior in their own homeland. Their eyes are more deadened with absence of hope. The issues that we deal with seem to be similar as yours, debilitating, crushing sometimes. And it's wrong. I got a story about voyaging canoes. It might be very something very confusing to you. I know uh, Joe had uh, allowed me an hour and 40 minutes, so I brought plenty of slides. I'm not much of a public speaker, um, but I, I am really honored to bring this story from my small sets of islands where I live in the middle of the Pacific, because it's a story about my teachers and the, the journey that we've been on as uh, new, renewed voyagers in the Pacific, and uh, that journey um, shaped our lives, defines our values tells us who we are, um, and in a way that um, I think has helped with the change. And I think in the, in the sense that it, it, the change that, that I might be suggesting uh, and implying in this uh, uh, presentation is not so much about medical care, but it's more about the issue of being well inside, to deal with those issues of the of what happens to children when they're born feeling that they're second rate in their own homeland. And that has to change. Um, a little bit of history, the, the Hawaiian Islands are the uh, most isolated high island archipelago on the planet. And the question that is raised is how did the first peoples get there? So this is that story, and, and the guess is that, and we're guessing because so much has been forgotten in the last 2,000 years that this first voyaging canoe that made it to Hawaii, we don't know the name, we don't know the name of the captain, we don't know the navigator's name. Uh, we guess that it came from isles in the south, someplace cl close to Tahiti or the Marquesas Islands. The, we guess that the voyage probably took about 2,400 miles across open ocean, and it arrived in, in, in Hawaii about 2,000 years ago. And um, 
And all that guessing takes place because there has been chronically over the time in the last 200 years so much forgetting. And um, about 200 years ago, the, well, in some ways you would argue that that voyage, and I do this in a very humble way, that that voyage, that first voyage, that the first footprint of human beings on the Hawaiian Islands could have been argued as the longest open ocean voyage of its time. And you could argue that that was the greatest ocean exploration feat and navigation maybe in human history of that time. And yet when you go to, um, can you guys see the slides from over there? Because this is going to be a really bad presentation if you can't. Um, and can we turn on the lights? I'm better in the dark, if you can. Uh, or at least less intimidated. Uh, um, yeah, when, when you guys can. Um, 200 years ago, as you guys know, the, uh, it was the arrival for the first time of the Europeans was, was really Captain Cook would come to Hawaii, and he, in his journals, as a scientist, he kept really complete journals, and um, he talked about a population of Native Hawaiians that were um, strong, that they were intelligent, productive. He talked about Native Hawaiians that um, they had the best tenure of, uh, of the use of fresh water, and that they had the highest productivity of foods on, on these small islands. And, and he sent the first person that he put on shore was a man by the name of Lieutenant Bly on the southern tip of the Big Island. And, um, and the census, they guessed that the population was on the median side of the population in, in the Hawaiian Islands, about 800,000 Native Hawaiians. And, um, um, and they were fully sustainable, extraordinary, powerful. Then you fast forward 100 years later, and uh, we're finding that our people are dying, that 800,000 people by 1920 had diminished to 24,000. So out of 34 Native Hawaiians, only one would survive European disease. It's the same story. Uh, all I'm trying to do is give you the context of the value of the voyaging canoes. Um, when you come to the issue and what I appreciated about Mr. White's comments was the raising of his, his grandmother. And um, my father was born in 1924, and he might have been the first of 100 generations that wasn't taught culture, wasn't taught language, wasn't taught genealogy. Therefore, he didn't know who he was. In uh, 1926, um, it would be the year that our public schools, by not by law, but by policy, fundamentally disallowed Hawaiian culture and language to be taught in the schools. The process of forgetting was all taking place, and it was in place. Um, and then I was born um, in the early 50s, and I was born to the world's best two parents who worked more than full-time jobs, and uh, my Next most important caregivers uh, in my life were my two grandmothers. And my father's mother was pure Hawaiian, and when we would go to her house as young children around the, around the age of four or five, I recall, I don't remember what she said, but I remember walking, being in that room. In her room, she lived in an old wooden house that had this big, uh, what we call pune'e. It's a, a big bed in the middle of the room where she would meditate, where she would, um, rest where she would, uh, where she would dream. And, and members of her generation would say she was clairvoyant and that she could see things that's gonna happen to primarily family members. Um, sometimes she was good, sometimes she was not all that good. One time she she's had a premonition that the Martians were coming to Hawaii, and they got all her, all her friends up on the mountain, and took all this gin to give it to them for gifts. They never showed up, so they just drank it at the top of Tantalus. <laughs> but she was always connected to her family. And she would tell, one thing about her, she was an extraordinary um, storyteller. And these stories, I don't remember her words, but I know how it made me feel, being a young boy she would sit down on this pone'e 
and talk about her grandfather when she was a young child. And um, he, was a, he was a fisherman. He was a fisherman, uh, and he was an ocean man. And I think that story impacted what navigated my life and that gravity to the sea. She talked with him with, um, she, she would talk about him coming to a place called, we call Kavaihoa, and he would pick her up by a fishing canoe and paddle her up the coast, called the Kaivi Coast, called the Bone. And it was so rough and so, because of the white water, they would call it the Bone and come in at dawn. When she talked about my grandmother, my, my, her grandfather, she, um, she communicated best not with her words but with her eyes. She would sit up, she'd be erect, she'd be proud, she'd look you right through you, and you'd remember that you need to know him because he was a great ocean man. And when she spoke like that, she was fully alive. And, um, and she gave you her sense of pride. She gave you her sense of love for this man because he's Hawaiian and he's an ocean man. Then she changed the story. She would talk about her being a young child and going to school, story that you know, and being beaten by school teachers, having her speak first language, Hawaiian, and dancing hula. And, um, and she went to a school called Kamehameha Schools for the education, or primarily of the well-being of Native Hawaiians, having Hawaiian nests being beaten out of you. When she talked about that, those stories, she would slouch down. She'd become weakened. She was not powerful. And she wouldn't look at you. That was the first inkling of understanding the relationship between being Hawaiian and being shame. Um, I was too young to really understand what she's trying to say, and certainly too young to do anything about it, but I wasn't too young to feel that, and that somehow I never had the maturity to ask her, why are you teaching these lessons? But for some reason, in hindsight, looking back, it was like preparing you, preparing for you to go into society. You ought to be proud. It's your land, but for some reason, you're not because of who you are. And that journey of stepping into that society, primarily in school, where you, being Native Hawaiian, was absent in the values of education that was so fundamental to define who we are. And I grew up um, getting more and more angry, and more and more enraged at um, that the identity that defines me is something that's not valued. The identity that defines me is something that's very unhealthy. And, um, you know, I was lucky. Um, like my dad, I, I look back at that decision by my grandmother not to teach him. Some, you know, the obvious would be that don't teach him Hawaiian because Hawaiian is not valued in this, in this society, therefore he doesn't need it. I, don't, I think it's worse than that. I think my grandmother believed, and she was a very loving person, if you teach you your identity, if you teach you to be who you were, you're going to get hurt. And... Um, we were going down that path of forgetting, and we're going down that path of extinction. I was just lucky, in the right place at the right time, um, to just be there. Um, two years after high school, my whole ki uh, kindergarten to 12th grade high school, there was only one Hawaiian history class, half a semester. It was uh, an elective. You, you didn't need to take it if you didn't want to take it. Um, and that's all I knew. It began at Kamehameha the first, ended at modern day. I had no idea where I came from. I had no idea where my ancestral homeland is. I had no idea how they got here. Um, and then, then my life changed. It was two years after high school. I used to paddle, six men paddling canoes for a club called Hui Nalu uh, in Hawaii Kai. I don't know if you guys know where that place is, on, on the island of Oahu. But we would launch our paddling canoes into this uh, small little canal, go out to the practice site. I was a novice bee, first-year paddler. Um, but across this little canal, 
There was a set of old wooden houses, and um, I know the power of the visionary, I know the power of the mentor. In this one wooden house was an extraordinary man. He's a dreamer. In the voyaging, he was really the father of the canoe. His name was Herb Kavainui Kane, uh, Hawaiian, born in Hawaii, and he was an uh, artist and historian. And he, it's interesting, he left Hawaii, his father took him to Chicago when he was seven, and he primarily lived away from Hawaii. And it's so interesting that he had this extraordinary dream about building a voyaging canoe. And what he, what he did was, he kept that dream very quiet, but in the canal where we practiced, he had these two 22-foot, very small surfing canoes lashed together into a double hull canoe with a Hobie Cat sail on it, and then he would, um, he would um, come over to the canoe club and, and ask for volunteers. He would ask for volunteers to come and help him paddle the canoe outside the reef so he can go sailing. Every time he would come, I would go. Uh, novice bee paddler, just wanted to go learn and go play on the ocean, had no idea what that canoe represented. And every time he'd come, I would go help him paddle it out, out the sea. And then it was, um, and we'd go sailing around. Um, and then it was, uh, it was a late spring 19, in 1974 that this man had this dream that he kept very quiet. No voyaging canoes existed in Hawaii for at least 600 years. And he had this dream in his mind. But what he was doing, even way back in 1974, he was recruiting the top watermen in Hawaii, the best. And uh, in our canoe club, the two co head coaches, uh, one was a guy by the name of Billy Mitchell, top paddler, and another guy's name was uh, Kalaku Kea, who was uh, arguably uh, defined as the best ocean man in Hawaii in the time. And they were our head coaches. He invited those two guys to a dinner in that spring night in 74. And I think, you know, I never really asked her why, but. I think he, he invited me to the dinner, novice B, kind of brand new paddler, um, because I went with him so much. I, I think he just believed the least he would do is just feed me at least one dinner. And um, we walked into his house, and this artist had uh, 19 oil paintings of voyaging canoes from places like Aotearoa and uh, from the Cook Islands, from many different island groups. He, he was kind of a messy guy. He had these nautical charts everywhere of these islands um, like Tahiti and like, and like the Marquesas Islands. These canoes and these places had no connection to me at all. And um, they made no sense until we sat down at dinner and Herb Kane starts to quietly talk about the journey, about building a voyaging canoe, about sailing back to the homeland of your ancestors, about bringing pride and dignity back to your culture. And uh, he was quiet in, this, in society, but not making it public, because he didn't believe that the society would get it nor value it. He was recruiting the best ocean guys. But I know the power of the mentor. Because it was after dinner when he took us outside, and he took our imagination and our eyesights up to the stars. And he, um, these 7,000 dots of light that go over our head every night, he started to make order. He started to create a map. He took us from the North Star through a whole set of stars in the eastern horizon all the way down to the Southern Cross. And it was then when he said, and these are the stars that we will use to find our way to pull Tahiti out of the sea, bring back dignity, bring back honor. It was in that single moment in hindsight where the power of the mentor re-navigates your whole personal journey. It was there when I, in hindsight, can look back at that single moment when I knew that fundamentally I was going to be a part of something extraordinarily special. And fundamentally, I needed to be there. And fundamentally, at the same time, there was a place that you could take that anger and that rage, which is an extraordinarily powerful emotion, and put it onto something and make it productive and meaningful in your life. And, uh, and we were going to be part of something of learning new things, stuff that is much deeper and much more meaningful than the stuff that we learned in school. And um, what Herb talked to us about was this, the Pacific Ocean, one-fifth the surface of the Earth, the uh, biggest ocean on the Earth. Uh, he talked about 
this place and this nation called Polynesia. That is uh, Hawaii, in, Hawaii in the north and Aotearoa, New Zealand in, in the southwest and Rapa Nui, Easter Island in the east. He talked about in terms of being 10 million square miles, geographically bigger than Russia, largest nation on earth. He talked about that this place is three times the size of the continental United States. And if you just respectfully exclude the landmass of Aotearoa and try to add up all the other islands and add that total square miles up, you can fit all those islands in one third the state of New York. That there's 600 times more water than there is land. And this place was, uh, it was explored, it was discovered, it was colonized about 3,000 years ago. And um, he starts talking about an extraordinary journey of a people and a nation that was defined by the success of canoes finding islands. And um, uh, real quickly, uh, even though Polynesia is the largest nation on Earth, geographically, we know that there's evidence of Polynesians getting to Australia. In November of this year, you'll see a, you may see a National Geographic special that's coming up that's strongly suggesting with new evidence, primarily with DNA, that Polynesians got to North America and South America, um, and that the Haida natives always claim that when we our relationship to them, well, some of them, uh, at least the ones that we knew, they say they didn't come from from the Siberian Peninsula, they came from isles in the south. In 1992, um, two independent DNA uh, research projects indicated that the Haida natives had strong genetic Polynesian makeup. And if you go around the map onto the other side, in the in middle of the Indian Ocean, you find an island called Madagascar. The people on Madagascar maintain the names of their mountains and their oceans to be the same as Polynesia. So even though that's 10 million square miles, in many ways, they were global. Uh, her fundamental questions were really simple, okay? We know where they came from. We know when they made their voyaging. How did they do it? In answering the questions, we can help our young people grow up to be proud of who they are. How did they build big voyaging canoes out of limited resources on islands? And how did they sail voyages over 2,400 miles? And how did they navigate? How did they use a system of understanding deeply the signs of nature to find their way across the open ocean? Um, the project had, was difficult. The journey was hard. One of the real problems with, with, the, with the journey was the forgetting that there were no blueprints of deep sea voyaging canoes there. We had no idea how they trained. We don't know how they made the materials for the sails. Uh, we, we didn't know the spiritual preparation or the protocols. Um, we were beginning at ground zero. Um, and basically, that's why Herb just went ahead and he built this canoe called Hokulea, meaning the Star of Gladness. And this is an old slide of Hokulea on the, uh, the sacred beach of Kualo on the northern side of Kanuri Bay on the island of Oahu. This is a, this is a slide of the canoe that's... Uh, um, one day before the day she was launched on, on March 8, 1975. It was an extraordinary time because you had this, both the symbolism and the reality of this powerful vo voyaging canoe that was Hawaiian, that it started to challenge our thinking about who we were, and, is, and it started to challenge a larger society that had to deal with this voyaging canoe. But Hokulea, in my opinion, would have done nothing if it didn't find Tahiti. It had to find Tahiti. And um, one of the challenges were that who's going to navigate this canoe? And um, Herb's dream was a decade long before they ever launched the canoe. In 1969, that would be six years before Hokulea was even launched, he had sent, he was looking for a navigator of Polynesian descent. And out of all of that 10 million square miles, he ends up with this one man here by the name of Tevake from the island of Santa Cruz. And um, he's the last, and he's elderly. Herb sent a team down to his island. The team talked to him about the project, asked him to come navigate. And Tevake, like elders who are not really clear whether he could make that commitment, fundamentally said, well, we'll see. And the group went back home without the commitment. Herb received a letter from 
Tevaki's granddaughter about six months later. And in the letter it said, and I was told that Tevaki had a small sailing canoe in an old canoe house and um, got up one day, said goodbye to the whole family, took it out to sea by himself, and he never came back. And um, I never met him. Um, but on one hand, knowing his story, I understand what it feel, what extinction feels like. That um, 3,000 years is gone. The last great na navigator. We couldn't take care of him. We couldn't hold him. We couldn't find a place that he could teach another generation. It's gone. That's how extinction feels like. But at the very same time, someone like me trying to live and grow in the urban setting in Honolulu and finding myself as an ocean man, even though I never met this man, um, he was powerfully inspirational because I knew that he was born into the sea and he took his last journey by choice on the ocean. And that had to be respected. But the problem was, who's going to navigate I was not in the leadership role back then, but leadership was debating the question without the Polynesian navigator that we'll just go do it ourselves. Now, that's the kind of question that, that you start to ask when you don't know how much you don't know. And uh, it's a dangerous thing to do on the deep sea. But there was a thinking that we can do this ourselves, 2,400 miles, 2,500 miles to Tahiti. And there was, but, but again, Hokulea, Hawaii was lucky. There's a man by the name of Mike McCoy who was a Peace Corps worker in Micronesia, not Polynesia. And in, he was assigned to an island called Satawa in the middle of the West, in the West Carolines. And on that island, um, there was master navigators. And this is one of them. Um, his name is Mao Piailuk. If there's any name that we would remember in relationship to voyaging, it would be this, this man, Mao Piailuk. He, um, uh, he was uh, a master navigator by their definition, culturally in Micronesia, and there were six at the time, and he was the youngest. And um, Mike McCoy was at a meeting in Honolulu and said, if you guys want a navigator, there's one right down five miles away in Kiwalo Basin in Honolulu. He's living on a UH, uh, University of Hawaii research ship uh, teaching scientists how to catch tuna with, uh, with traditional lures. And uh, they went down and they asked Mao, uh, they talked to him about the project, and they asked him um, whether he would come and navigate. Mao could barely speak English, but I was told that his response was immediate, yes. Now, consider this. His canoe is 27 feet long, Hokulea is 62 feet long. He is will be sailing with a crew he doesn't know. And that he'll make, be making a voyage that'll be six times longer than any other voyage he made before as a master. And he'll be going south of the equator for the first time and being underneath southern stars that he's never seen. We've debated why he made that decision. Many on the obvious say it's because he's a master navigator. He, he's a courageous man. He, wants to challenge. But in hindsight, looking back, in Micronesia was the, the footprint of forgetting was already starting. There's six navigators that are masters. He's the last. And in many ways, Mao, in his genius, in my opinion, he came to fundamentally save us as a people. He understood that more than even we did. And um, that wasn't it. Very critical decision to be made. This is the island he comes from. It's island of Satawal. It's a, a mile and a quarter long, half mile wide, no lagoon. The highest soil on the, on the island is eight feet. And 99.9% um, and .9 of the earth doesn't even know the name of Satawal. But for us, this is our traditional island. This is where our ancestral knowledge comes from. The challenge uh, for Mao was to sail from Honolulu Bay, Maui, to Tahiti on that blue line. So, uh, and it would, you'd be crossing the world's two biggest, largest wind systems, northeast trade winds, southeast trade winds. And where they collide near the equator is a place called the doldrums, the cloudiest place on, on Earth. 
Uh, the reason why I raise that is because the system of navigation requires you to see nature, and uh, the doldrums is so, um, there's so many days that you can't see sun and moon and stars. It's a huge challenge to get through that 300-mile band. Um, 